Hello, I am Martin Packer. I am the author of The Science of Qualitative Research. This is one of a series of videos about the theory and practice of qualitative research. This is the first of three videos about interpretation. It explores something of the history of hermeneutics, the theory of interpretation, and how this is relevant to qualitative research today. Interpretation is often assumed to be completely subjective, but in fact the heart of all research is interpretation, not only qualitative research. Even coding is a kind of interpretation, though badly done. So I want to explain why interpretation is so important and how it is the basis for systematic and convincing analysis of qualitative material. Sometimes it is said that in qualitative research, the researcher is an instrument. That's not quite right. Instruments are used in the natural sciences to measure things. An instrument provides a reading, which is usually a number. But it is true that in qualitative research, the researcher is crucial not as an instrument, but as a human being who is struggling to understand other human beings. Which is what we do all the time, right? In our everyday lives, we go around understanding and trying to understand and misunderstanding what other people are doing. But how do we understand? And how do we recognize the occasions when we misunderstand? What is understanding? The coding approach to qualitative research ignores these questions. When a researcher codes what someone says in an interview, they are imposing a single way of understanding those words. It turns out there's a whole theory of interpretation, which began over 200 years ago. That theory is called hermeneutics. It is named after Hermes, who was the messenger of the Greek gods, interpreting the gods' wishes to ordinary people. In fact, Aristotle titled one of his books On Interpretation more than 2,000 years ago. But in the 17th century, people began to reflect systematically on understanding and interpretation because of disagreements over how to understand passages in the Bible. From there, hermeneutics quickly turned to everyday texts and to other cultural artifacts. I want to briefly describe three theories of hermeneutics in their historical sequence. The first is the work of Friedrich Schleiermacher. He wanted to provide a theory of the interpretation not only of religious texts, but of all kinds of written texts and also of spoken discourse, interpretation in general, in other words. In Schleiermacher's view, writing and talking are expressions of the author's or the speaker's inner thoughts and feelings, which is exactly the assumption that many qualitative researchers make today. And remember, this was back in the early 1800s. Schleiermacher thought that the goal of understanding is to grasp these thoughts and feelings. And to do that, we would need to study how language works and also study the author or speaker, their setting, their psychology, and the other things they have said or written. Furthermore, this process would move in a circle. For one thing, we can understand part of a text only in terms of the whole text, and vice versa. We understand a word or a phrase in terms of everything that has been said or written. In addition, we understand a text in terms of its context, and vice versa. Schleiermacher emphasized that all of this would take a lot of work. It's not a matter of quickly attaching a code. It requires a great deal of study. Indeed, and this is the problem with this first theory of hermeneutics, the work would never really end. How could one ever know, for example, from studying one of Shakespeare's plays, or one of J.K. Rowling's books, if you prefer, that one had come to understand the author's personal thoughts and feelings at the time they wrote. Yet that was what Schleiermacher wanted to do. The second theory of hermeneutics 
is that of William Diltai. Diltai is well known for his proposal that the human sciences, the Geisteswissenschaften, are just as scientific as the natural sciences. It was Diltai who suggested that while the natural sciences provide explanation, the human sciences provide understanding. I believe that the human sciences also provide explanation in the form of constitutive explanations, but that is a topic for another video. Diltai, like Schleiermacher, saw hermeneutics as a general methodology for the human sciences. He pointed out that when we try to understand art, or literature, or history, or culture, or even just someone's words, we are part of these phenomena. We speak the language. We grew up in the culture. We have a special kind of access that we don't have when we study butterflies, for example. What we need to do is figure out how to use this pre-existing access. For Diltai, the scientific study of what humans do requires spelling out, articulating our understanding. This is what he called our lived experience, the way we are, in a sense, united with the objects that we are trying to understand. When we read a novel, for example, we don't study it the way one would study a butterfly. We read it, we become involved, caught up in the plot, and excited to discover what happens next. For Diltai, a book or a conversation or a sculpture or a work of art isn't just an expression of the creativity of the author or the speaker or the sculptor, is it, it is an expression of life itself. This was Diltai's romantic view of understanding and interpretation. Romantic with a capital R. For Diltai, then, our lived experience is a contact with human history and with life itself. It is the basis upon which we understand other people and the basis upon which we understand ourselves. And interpretation is the articulation, the spelling out of this lived experience. What Diltai paid little attention to, however, was the fact that there are many human cultures, each with its own history. He didn't see the significance of the fact that the researcher, the interpreter, is inevitably located in a particular, tr particular tradition with its particular culture and history. Tiltai wanted the human sciences to be able to provide objective knowledge, but he couldn't successfully explain how this could be possible. Yes, we all participate in life, in the life process, but does this mean we will all have the same understanding of a text, of an interview, for example? No, it doesn't. The third theory of hermeneutics is that of Hans-Georg Gadamer. Gadamer had a different view of the aim of understanding and interpretation. He disagreed that it was to grasp the original creative act behind a text or a book or a painting. An interpreter, he said, can never get inside the mind of another person, or inside their life for that matter. Gadamer proposed that our everyday understanding is always practical, when we understand and interpret what someone says or does, we do so for its relevance to our current situation. Karama called this application. To understand and interpret someone's words is to apply them to our situation and to put them to practical use. A person's words have relevance when they help us understand our situation and the challenges that we face. This means that interpretation is like asking questions of a text or of the words that someone has spoken. And what we find depends on what we ask. There is no single or fixed meaning. Understanding someone's words is an experience, an event. It is really not a matter of understanding the person who spoke, but of understanding what they spoke about. So, what does this mean for qualitative research? It means that there is not, there cannot be, a single correct interpretation, no single correct code. What someone says is always open to multiple interpretations. This is obvious, isn't it? People understand a movie, for example, in different ways. They interpret a novel in different ways. As researchers, we cannot ignore this fact about everyday understanding. 
How could we possibly claim to have identified the single true meaning of a few lines in an interview transcript? That would be ridiculous. It would be arrogant. Meaning, then, is not in the words. Meaning arises, it occurs, in the interaction between text and speaker, or between spoken words and listener. Understanding a person's words is always an active process. Researchers are actively making sense of what they read and hear and see. Furthermore, we cannot step out of history, out of our time and place. Our understanding of someone's words is never neutral and objective. We always have preconceptions that stem from who we are and what we are doing. Some of these preconceptions may be prejudices, which need to be changed and corrected. And a researcher's understanding will also depend upon their project, on what they are trying to, un to accomplish, what they care about. In another video, I talk about Jürgen Habermas's analysis of what he called knowledge constitutive interests. Knowledge, he said, is never disinterested. A researcher is always searching with an instrumental interest or a communicative interest or an emancipatory interest. In short, then, when we understand what someone has said or done, the meaning that we may think we simply find there, in fact, arises in our interaction with the words or acts. This means that our understanding depends upon our own origins and background, our culture and history. For example, we obviously need to understand the language that people are using. Our understanding will also depend on our research question and on the interest that guides our research. Furthermore, what we understand are not the thoughts and feelings or the beliefs and opinions of the people who spoke or acted. What we grasp is what they were talking about or what they, are, that way, what they were doing. In the next two videos, we will explore further the implications of all this for qualitative research. Finally, understanding leads to learning, to being changed. Humans are not instruments because instruments don't change, or they shouldn't change. Humans do change. Researchers can be, perhaps they ought to be, transformed by what they learn by talking with people and seeing how they live. This is not something to be ashamed of or something that should be outside the process of research. We conduct research in order to learn something and learning will change us. Well, thank you for watching. Write a comment and let me know what was useful in this video and what you'd like to see in other videos. And don't forget to watch the other two videos about interpretation.